the, uh, the book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament is a book about work, and work as we celebrated Labor Day uh, last week, uh, last weekend, and um, the story of this, right through the whole book of the Old Testament, is all about working, rebuilding the walls that had been broken down. The uh, uh, nation of Israel was trying to resettle after all the mistakes, and so they tried to rebuild some some structures that have been destroyed in invasions, and so we had a bunch of people get together to try to get that work done. Um, there's one, there was a thing on Facebook the other day of phrases that you just hate to hear. You know, things that are annoying. Uh, there's a number of phrases these days that really annoy me. Uh, I hate the phrase, let's circle back. I don't know, it just annoys me. I don't know why, it just annoys me. Uh, I hate the word walk because it's been over, stayed in over, done, and I'm fed up with it. Uh, but there's another one I hate here, and that's the word burnout. And I especially hate hearing that from 18 year olds. <laughs> you ever heard a teenager saying, oh man, I'm burnt out? You hardly start in life, you can't be burnt out already. I mean, it's, come on. You've got to wait till you're like 55 to see what's going on. But you hear it all the time, I'm burnt out. I, I hear it from Christians, I'm burnt out doing the Lord's work, I'm burnt out doing the burnt out coming to church, and blah, 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 and on and on and on. And so I was reminded, thinking about the whole thing about burnout, of the, uh, the, the logo of the Church of Scotland uh, that I used to be part of, the Presbyterian Church. Uh, and the, it is a picture of the St. Andrew's Cross, which is the basis of the British flag, the Union Jack, so it's a blue background with a white diagonal cross. It's the St. Andrew's, the national flag of Scotland. And that's on the logo as a cross, uh, superimposed over the burning bush. Remember the story of Moses? And uh, underneath, uh, I, think it's, I think it's not black, I think it's in English, it says, burned but not consumed. Remember the, the bush burned but didn't burn up, and so they did that whole thing. And so I thought about that, and I thought, you know what, what is it that keeps us from keeping on working for the Lord without getting, to use that horrible phrase, burnt out? How do we do that? Well, part of these guys way back in the day, in the EMI's day, discovered the secret of all that, and I want to share it with you. And I've actually used this, I've, this is not the first time I've, I've shared this message, the last time I shared this, I was actually to a bunch of businessmen in Austin uh, that were talking about the same thing. Now, some of them were Christians, some weren't, uh, but I thought the principles apply just as much to the area of business as it does to, to the church. And so here's the three things. And you know these words, and you've heard this many, many times, but here's the application from the book of Nehemiah, which is a lot bit different. Uh, the first thing that we need in order to, to get the job done without being burnt out is that wonderful word, Inspiration. Something's powerful about being inspired to do something. You know, it's like you look at the Sistine Chapel and you think, gosh, I mean, Michelangelo must have been inspired. You know, had a vision to paint it such a way. Obviously, it wasn't painting by numbers in the ceiling of the Sistine. I mean, he had something that he had envisioned in his mind. Same is true with William Pitts with the song, you know, Churchill Elwood, or, you know, Little Brown Church's song. Uh, he must have been inspired to write those words because there was nothing there. There was no little brown church in the veil. But he wrote the words to that thing, so he must have been inspired. And inspiration will take you a long way, won't it? Be inspired to do something. Nehemiah 4 14, it says this after I, Nehemiah talking, looked over, looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them, that's the opposition. When you try to build something, Guess what? You're always going to have opposition. That's too powerful, of course. Uh, remember the Lord, he said. Never mind those people. You know, you're also cranky folks that just don't see the vision or will be inspired. Um, he says, forget about them. Remember the Lord. What's he saying there? He's basically saying, keep your eyes on the prize. Keep your focus laser guided, if you will. Remember why you're doing this. And that's why a lot of Christians get burnt out, it's because they forget that ultimately every single thing that we do as a believer is unto the Lord. Even that horrible boss we've got. You know, Paul the Apostle tells us clearly that we serve beyond him. 
to serve the Lord, even in that job at John Deere or Ruby Award. Remember the Lord was their theme. He's the reason for our work. We do it unto the Lord first. Hudson Taylor was a famous missionary to China way back many, many, many years ago. And he said this, when God's work is done in God's way for God's glory, it will never lack God's supply. God is never obligated to pay for our selfish schemes. He's obligated to support his ministry. Let me say that again. When God's work is done in God's way for God's glory, it will never lack God's supply. Never. We do it unto him. God is never obligated to pay for our selfish schemes. So we've got to check out the vision we have for what we're doing, make sure it's for the Lord. God, doesn't, God does not appoint men and women to do great works for him, only to have them burn out. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul did that? Huh? Just for a minute. There he is in Philippi thinking, you know what? I said, I'm fed up with this. I'm fed up with the opposition. I'm fed up with the beatings and the stonings. I'm fed up being thrown in prison every now and again. You know, I'm going to take a break. I'm going to, I don't know, I'm going to go to uh, Spain find a beach and just lie there. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to These people in Nehemiah's day had a desire to finish the work and do it well because they saw it as a service to the Lord, not to the walls of Jerusalem. When we see a ministry in that light, we'll be less likely to make quick decisions to quit or change based on our feelings alone. Sometimes we, we make every decision based upon our feelings. Well, let's be honest with you, our feelings change almost on a daily basis, right? Depending on how you get up that morning. Somebody once joked, there's only two ways to get up in the morning. One is to get up and say, good morning, Lord. The other one is to wake up and say, good Lord, it's morning. <laughs> so where were you this morning? <laughs> I had a long day yesterday with the wedding and I went to hear Guys play at the B you know, and uh, dance with my wife because she said, well, You need to dance with her before you leave. And I have to tell you tomorrow. And uh, so we had, a, we had a great time, but boy, she woke up tired this morning. So. But it was a good morning, Lord, kind of sort of. Second thing you need is not just inspiration, but aspiration. Aspiration. Verse 15 it says, When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot, because they were trying to you know, submarine the, or torpedo the, the work. And that God had frustrated it. We all returned to the wall and his own work. They had a plan. Their desire was to finish the work and get it done, do well. That was their aspiration. But aspiration, think about this aspiration is the product of vision. You've got to have the inspiration before you have the aspiration. Uh, someone once said, so you've got to listen to this carefully. Someone once said that vision that looks inward becomes duty. Vision that looks outward becomes aspiration. But vision that looks upward becomes faith. Vision that looks inward becomes duty. Vision that looks outward becomes aspiration. And vision that looks upward becomes faith. Some of us don't aspire to anything because we're so busy looking inward and not outward. I'm amazed at times that, you know, uh, people can live as Christians and it's like the world just goes on by, you know. They don't see what's going on in the world and what to do, even to pray about it as, as a believer. It's just, everything just drifts on by. And we can't build that. These builders had a goal, had a vision, had aspiration outside of themselves to get the job done. I think the vision, at least the aspiration, is essential to avoid burnout and the things we do. Whatever you do, whatever you do. Vision without a task is a dream. Not a wrong vision, but if you don't have a task aligned with a vision, it's just a dream. And poor vision limits your ability to work and be effective for Christ. We need vision. We need that aspiration to get work done. Paul had that clearly in Philippians 3.14. He says, I press towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul knew exactly what he was doing, what he was supposed to be doing. He had received a clear commission from the Lord. 
And that was his goal, that was his vision, that was his inspiration, aspiration to get a thing done. And he did. Eventually, in the end of his life, he said, I've, I've run the race, fought the good fight, got it done. I remember a pastor back in England telling me that the reason he did a lot of stuff for the Lord and just kind of went out on a limb and, and was energetic and everything he did for Christ. He said, it was born out of a dream I had uh, where one of my grandkids, yet to be born grandkids at that time, uh, came up to him and said, oh, we had this dream of sitting on a park bench. And this grandkid comes up to him, looks at him in the eye and says, Grandpa, what did you do during the war? He knew right away from talking about the war, you know, like World War II. He's talking about the fight as a Christian. And he said, I told you, I came by and say, son, I was a conscientious objector. And that motivated him to re engage in the work of the Lord. Verse 21 through 23 in Nehemiah chapter 4 says this, So we continued to work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn until the stars came out. At that time I also said to the people, Have every man in his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so they could serve as guards by night. Because people wanted to destroy the work. And workmen by day, so there were guards by night with spears and workmen with trowel and you know, hammer or whatever else during the day. He's going to say, neither I nor my brothers nor my men nor the guards with me took off our clothes. Each had his weapon, even when he went for water, worked from the rising of the sun until the stars appeared. So this inspiration and this aspiration, what do you think the third one is? Perspiration. Psalm 133 is an interesting psalm. Here's what it says. It says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. For there the Lord commands the blessing, life forevermore. I'm going to read that again. Psalm 133. How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. But then he says something just before the end of that. He says it's like the oil that flows on the head down through the beard, down the robes, even Aaron's beard. Now what he's talking about is the anointing oil that would be used to set aside priests or Levites or whatever else. Aaron was the chief of that. The oil that would flow down. Then he says it's also like the dew on Mount Hermon. So on one side he says it's like oil. And then he uses another analogy, it's like water, like dew. Now the interesting thing about the Psalm 133 is it's called a psalm of ascents, A-S-S-E-N-T-S, ascents. And it would be a psalm that would be sung by all the pilgrims that were going up to Jerusalem for one of the great feasts in the Jewish calendar. And as they went up to Jerusalem to Mount Zion, because Jerusalem is set on a hill, actually seven hills, but we go up that way, they would be singing these psalms together as they went together to sacrifice before the Lord and to be faithful to his speech that he would call him to in Jerusalem. Here's the thing. One of the places in life that oil and water exist together is that thing called sweat. And so what David is saying in the psalm is there is something about the people of God working together that brings unity and blesses the Lord, because the Lord says, there, at that point, there I'm commanding the blessing. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And these guys understood that. As they worked together, as they guarded the walls, as they laid the bricks, with a spear in one hand, not troll in the other. My dad used to say, your hard work's not easy, that's why it's called hard work. Hard work costs, it involves a toil, it takes a toll on it. You know, we're in a, you know, I've never been ministering in a rural community, but I'm always amazed at how hard, you know, the folks here work, you know, farmers. It's just inspiring. You know, the thing is, a far, you know, back in uh, Austin, people get up and go to work. Here, people get up and work all around them. It's already there. So it's a very different thing. Someone says success may be sweet, 
but a seeker of his sweat. In fact, the dictionary is the only place where success comes before work. But a lot of people want it that way. You don't notice that these days? They want all the bellies, all the goodies without doing a lick of work. Like somebody else do, you know? Just send me that check. I want to work at it, I don't want to do anything, even though I could. I just want it to be enabled by whoever, the government or whoever that is. I wonder what the sacrifice was in the final life of the builders in Nehemiah's day. My dad was an elder and a deacon in our church in Scotland. They built the church themselves, churches of this size probably. Uh, they built it by hand, all the men of the church. Uh, no contractors in the sense of hiring people, so they did the whole thing. And I was just a kid, but one night, uh, we got a, uh, somebody came in the door. I opened it, I was about seven or eight, I think. And this guy turns up and says, Andy, the church is on fire. So we jumped in a bus, we got a car in those days, we didn't know where the church was, and the church in the place is totally gone. Sad that the guy who is the head fire master, fire chief for the whole region was one of the elders. He was watching his own church burn to the ground without being able to save it. I'll never forget. <laughs> They had a meeting in a hall at the YMCA <coughs> to discuss what to do. And as I kid, you get inspired by watching older men and women having those kind of discussions. And the first thing they said was, can we start Monday to rebuild this time? And there wasn't even a thought of not doing anything. And so for the next year, nine months to a year, I watched my dad come in. No, I actually did. I would go down with my mom, because my dad would work his shift with the railway, and his railway clothes on, go straight with a whole bunch of other guys to the site, and work until with these guys, until the stars come out, and all the wives would come down with dinner so they could eat it on the spot and get the job done. That was inspirational because they had a clear vision. They were inspired to rebuild. And they were not short and perspiring to get the thing done. Nehemiah's story is about getting the, done, the job done, seeing the job through, not giving it, no matter what the cost happens to be. Sadly, we have lost, I think, as a, a nation, as a people, and sometimes as church, I mean the larger body of Christ, that inspiration, that aspiration, that perspiration to get the job done for Christ. Anybody could have complained about all the work of the Apostle Paul. He says in 2 Corinthians 4, 8, 9, We're hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. I really, really, really am looking forward to meeting that guy. I'll tell you what, if, if, anyone, if, any, if you want any inspiration at all, Study the Apostle Paul. He was pressed, not crushed. He was stretched, but not snapped. He was hounded, but not abandoned. He was down, but not counted out. Why? Because in all the things that these men back in Nehemiah's day had, he had inspiration. He was called by Jesus himself to the ministry on the road to Damascus. He aspired. He had a heavenly goal that he's pressing forward to every single day. And he had perspiration. He worked hard at every single thing he did and received the reward that the Lord had promised him. Burnout should never be a problem for the man or the woman in the service of the Lord who is all three of those things. should never happen. I believe the greatest cure for spiritual and emotional burnout is to keep the flame of the Holy Spirit's presence alive in our hearts. Let it burn strongly every day so that we would be like that model, that logo for the Church of Scotland. We'd have that thing burning in us, but it's never consumed. It never goes away. It never. We, we actually fired up a fire pit last night, a couple of nights ago, for the first time in about a year. 
and uh, you know it was great. Watched the flames and all that. And all of a sudden, you see the embers go down, and it's out. Don't be a believer like that. You got to real light it all the time. Keep the fire burning in your heart. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love and your grace towards us. We pray that you would inspire us by the Holy Spirit to keep on keeping on, not to lose sight of the goal, which is to please you in every way and everything we do. Help us to keep a focus. Help us to be continually inspired and inspired to do your work. And Lord, thank you for the energy that you give us by the Holy Spirit to get things done. Father, watch over us this week as we uh, go about our business. Help us, Lord, to be good representatives of your word and your kingdom. Father, we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen.